so that you know we're in chapter one, was intending to take you through the first chapter. I thought, well, you know, I'll just do one of those, just touch this and touch on that. So we're going to go through three verses tonight. Kind of shows you where I was, where I ended up. We're going to do the first three verses. We'll pick up at verse four next time and go through the rest of the chapter. But I want to give you an introduction today and give you a foundation for the book of Hebrews uh, in the first few verses today. So let's read together here in Hebrews chapter one at verse one. We'll read to verse 3, and we'll get into our study. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through to verse 3. The writer writes, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high so let's begin here in our study of the book of hebrews with a basic introduction one the most obvious thing i can point out is the authorship is unknown for sure Notice how he begins without an introduction. It simply begins in the English translation by saying, God who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. There's no introduction, and therefore the authorship is unknown for certain. Now, there are various theories as to who perhaps wrote this, and various names have been postulated over the centuries in the history of the church. Uh, obviously, the... Uh, one candidate would be the Apostle Paul, and there are many, many scholars who believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, others would say that it would have been Apollos, and some say Barnabas. Some say it possibly was Luke. Uh, others would say Silas, and, and others would even say Philip. Um, all of these men have been postulated as the uh, ones who God used to write this. Uh, but the fact is, as we look at this particular uh, book, the author remains unknown to us. Now, that doesn't mean that the author was unknown to those whom he sent the letter to because he actually sent uh, the letter to those who knew him. How do we know that? Well, it says it in chapter 13 at verse 23. In Hebrews chapter 13, 23, it says, Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. And so the, the readers of Hebrews in the first century knew exactly who it was who wrote to them, but we don't know today because the authorship is not declared to us. So, many believe it was Paul, and that's not a bad guess, but we really don't know for sure. The time of the writing has been placed between the years 64 and 68, and the reason very simply is this. This is a book that is written to Jewish readers, and yet the temple and its destruction is not mentioned in the book. Now, if this was written after the destruction of the temple, we know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, it would have been mentioned because this is a book written to Hebrews. It was not mentioned, and therefore, uh, conservative scholarship says that it was written before the destruction, and many would believe probably around the year 64 up to the year 68. Now, there is a reason for this book to have been written, and you find that reason in Hebrews. Turn with me for a moment to chapter 5. I'll show it to you right from the beginning. Why was this book written? We'll see in a variety of ways why it was, but one of the reasons uh, that you can find chapter 5, beginning at verse 12, uh, lets us know. It says in, in chapter 5, verse 12, uh, following, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And uh, you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of a full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In chapter 6, verse 1, he says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. That word perfection speaks of maturity. Let's leave the basics and grow. And so the purpose of the writing, the reason that this was written was to bring the readers to spiritual maturity. And so that's a great book for us as a church to read because I desire to become spiritually mature and I'd like us to together become mature and therefore reading and studying this book is going to help us in that way. Now, as you go through Hebrews, you're going to note something with me 
Uh, throughout this letter, the author wants the reader to know that Jesus is better. If there's a key word in the book of Hebrews, it is the word better. The word better is used 13 times in 13 chapters. And so he wants us to know that Jesus Christ is better. The word better the, uh, there means excellent or useful or, or giving you an advantage. Jesus Christ is more excellent and gives you an advantage in life. He wants the Hebrews to know that because they're drifting back. The Hebrew Christians are drifting back into uh, Judaism. They are returning. Some of them are, are, are longing to return to, to different ways because as Christians, they're being rejected. As Christians, they're going through hard times, times that they didn't suffer as, as Hebrews at all. And so they're drifting back. And so, so the writer wants them to know, listen, Jesus is better. He's better than the law. He's better than the temple. He's better than everything. He's better than everything that you had before. He's better than the prophets. He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than the priesthood. He's better than the law. He's better than Melchizedek. He brings a better hope, a better testament, a better promise, a better sacrifice. He gives us a better country, a better resurrection. In, every, in everything, Jesus Christ is better. So don't abandon him for the law. And so that's what we're going to be seeing as we go through the book of Hebrews, how that Jesus Christ is better. And you see this almost immediately as we go into this particular letter. Let's begin now at verse 1, and we'll look at the first three verses here in Hebrews, and then next time we're together, pick it up at verse 4 and move on through the book. But at verse 1, again, he says, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now... The author launches into his letter without an introduction. Of course, this is one of the reasons why many scholars doubt that Paul wrote this epistle. Paul, when he wrote his letters, would always identify himself. And as you study the epistles of, of Paul, you will note that he always begins by saying Paul, and perhaps referring to himself as an apostle, or always as an apostle, he will speak to us and identify himself. In this particular book, uh, there is no introduction of a name, and so... That's the point. Uh, many think that he might not have written this. But the fact is, is that God is not remaining silent. And the point he's making is that God has consistently revealed himself to man over time. What he's speaking about in verse 1 when he says at various times and in different ways he spoke in time past of the fathers by the prophets, is uh, he's speaking of, of a special revelation. When you read um, your Bible, you're going to note that God reveals himself in a variety of ways. We're going to look at those some of those ways in just a moment. But you have what is called special revelation and you have what is called general revelation. General revelation can be broken into two basic categories, though there are others, but two basic ones. Uh, when you have a general revelation, one would be your conscience, you know, because everybody has a conscience and you know when you do right and you know when you do wrong. And, and Paul would argue concerning that as being part of the way that God has created us to help us to come to him when he wrote to the Romans. He also speaks concerning creation. Creation speaks of the reality of someone who created all things. Every house is built by some man. He who built all things is God. And so creation, that, that existence that we have, has to speak of somebody who is a pri primary mover, the first cause of all things. And so you have creation, and you also have conscience. But you also have what is called a special revelation, and, and that is when God breaks into history and, and gives to us insight concerning himself, and that's what what the writer is speaking of here in Hebrews chapter 1. He's telling us that God in various times and in different ways spoke and therefore is speaking concerning revelation, special revelation. Now, the reason that he has to give to us, or is not so much that he has to, but he chooses to give to us special revelation is very simple. It's because if he did not reveal himself to us, we could never know him. It's that simple. If God doesn't say, I am here we would not find him. I mean, if the God of the universe chooses to hide himself, who here can play cosmic hide and seek and find him? Not a single one of us can. Uh, he's not like my grandson Josiah. My grandson Josiah is really getting into hide and seek for some reason now. And uh, he was doing that uh, the other day. I'll tell him, hide, Josiah, hide, because uh, the wicked witch is coming, another name for his mom. Um, <laughs> hide. And uh, just the other day, he was sitting on my lap, my Josiah, and I could hear my daughter Corinne, his mama, coming into the room, and I had him sitting on my lap, and I'm behind my screen, and so my Josiah is sitting on my lap, and I said, hide, your mama's coming, hide from her, and he says, okay, and he puts his hands over his eyes and just sits there, and he is definitely sure that she does not see him, 
And, uh, and she comes walking in the room, and, he's got, and she doesn't notice where he's at. It's not that she doesn't see him, but my other daughter comes and begins speaking to her. And Josiah just can't take it. I mean, he waited quietly all of 10 seconds, and he begins to scream, ah, here I am, you know. Well, God doesn't do that. You know, he, he doesn't do that. If God chooses to hide from us, then man will never find him. We need to understand that. It makes sense to me. If he chooses to hide himself, man cannot find him. That's why Isaiah says of the Lord, surely thou art the God that hideth thyself. Unless you choose to reveal yourself to us, man by searching cannot find you out. There's no way. And so God chooses, and this is what you find in Scripture from, from uh, Genesis to Revelation, God chooses to reveal himself to us because we couldn't by searching find him. In, in, in 1 Timothy, in, in chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, uh, Paul said, uh, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light. So we couldn't approach him, we could not discover him were he not to reveal himself to us. But this God who has created all things and reveals himself to us chooses to do so in a variety of ways. Notice again at verse 1, God who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. And so God at various times and different ways spoke. At various times is another way of saying, and this is literal, in many portions or by many portions. Uh, that would speak of God revealing himself not in one immediate revelation, but piecemeal over time. Uh, it may be that he's referring to uh, the 39 books of the Old Testament, how you put those together to get a revelation of God. Uh, but uh, there are a variety of ways that he's chosen to do so because he says in verse 1 that he's done this in different ways. And so God has revealed himself through a variety of means. He, he used dreams. He uses visions. When you study the Old Testament, there's angelic visitations. There are various events. There are symbols. There are signs. And ultimately, he communicates uh, through his prophets. And that's what he says. He spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now, when he speaks of the fathers, that's another way of speaking of what would be referred to as the Old Testament patriarchs, the ancestors, of the readers of this particular letter, the Jewish nation. And God would reveal himself, and he did so to the patriarchs, and he used the prophets. In Numbers, in chapter 12, verse 6, it says, uh, God speaking, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. And so God is saying, when I reveal myself, I do so through prophets who reveal to you what they have seen. Now, ultimately, these prophets of God, these men whom he, ref he refers to, were used by God to write for us what we have in our hands, this Bible. God gave to us a revelation of the Word of God, and the prophets gave to us this message. Uh, the Bible says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke as they were carried along by the Spirit of God. That's 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. That's the revelation of God. God has given to us through the prophets the revelation of the Word of God. And he spoke in a variety of ways, which includes the revelation through the words the prophets gave to us. Now, in verse 2 continuing, he says, he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And so no prophet ever had in the Old Testament the entire revelation of God. God revealed himself, but he did so in a progressive manner. Now, we know that the Old Testament is without error, but yet it was pointing to the future. It was pointing to a time when God would take upon himself human flesh. And so God, through various things in the Old Testament, revealed himself, but in the New Testament has revealed himself perfectly through Jesus Christ. Now, this progressive revelation was to prepare people for the Son, and his full and his perfect revelation awaited the coming of Jesus Christ. If you take notes, John chapter 1, verse 1 says it this way, 
When John was writing his gospel, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then he went on in verse 14 of the same chapter to say, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word of God became human flesh and dwelt amongst us. That's called the incarnation. Incarnation is actually a Latin word, two words, in carne, in flesh. The incarnation is God taking upon himself human flesh. In the Old Testament, he used wonders. He used symbols. He had miracles that occurred. He, he revealed himself in a variety of ways through the written, written word, the witnesses of the, of the prophets. In the New Testament, he gives to us a full revelation of himself. That gives to us insight into the difference between the Christian faith and all man-made uh, uh, religion. God reveals himself to man. Man does not find God by man's own efforts. All you need to do is spend a little time looking at the variety of world religions, and there's so many hundreds of thousands it would be impossible to really do so in a lifetime. But the major systems, all of them look at them very closely, and you will notice that they work out their own salvation. Actually, they work for their own salvation, which makes it different than Christian faith. See, the Bible says, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. But in other religion, it is work for your own salvation. And there is a world of difference. And as a matter of fact, the world is the difference between those two isms. Christianity believes and teaches that God took upon himself human flesh and dwelt amongst men. And we, we, we beheld him. He was filled with grace and truth. And he revealed to us the way of the Father. He is that way. And we enter into the kingdom of God through faith through Jesus Christ. That's Christianity. All other re religions in the world say that you have to do something in, in order to gain that knowledge. You cannot find God, God reveals himself to you. That's the whole point of the introduction here, is to remind the readers that, that yes, you understand that your Old Testaments contain uh, information concerning God and how God revealed himself to your fathers. You understand that, but you need to understand that the final revelation came through the Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Word taken upon himself, human flesh and dwelling amongst men. Man cannot find God, God reveals himself to man. In John chapter 1, verse 18, John said it this way, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, Jesus said, All things are delivered to me by my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. So Jesus will draw me to a relationship with his Father, he reveals the Father to me, and in doing so, I have a relationship with God. That's what Hebrews chapter 1 is speaking about. Now, notice how he says in verse 2 that he has in these last days spoken to us. Now, he speaks of the last days. The last days can be also a synonym for the days of Messiah. The last days that we are living in now actually began at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on the 120 in the upper room as they were awaiting the promise of the Father. The Bible tells us that when that occurred, uh, Peter ha had stood up and began to preach. And, and in the book of Acts, if you take notes, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, this is what the apostle said. He said, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. That was on the day of Pentecost, and yet the apostle Peter identified that event as the last days. So we are living in the times of the last days, the days of Messiah. In 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. We are living in these last times, these last days. And so he says in verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And so this is the final revelation, Jesus Christ. He's the final word to man. There's no more revelation coming. 
There's no new way coming to man. You can know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Listen, this is very practical at this point. Um, that's one of the reasons why I, as a believer, do not recognize any other prophet other than those revealed in the Old and the New Testament. That's one of the reasons, as a matter of fact, that is the main and, and uh, central reason why I don't believe that uh, men like Muhammad were prophets of God. A believer will not do so and cannot do so because he came several centuries after Jesus Christ. And we know that Jesus is the final revelation. He is the last word to man. He says it this way in Revelation 22, 13. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And we know in Colossians 2, 3 that in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There is no need for future revelation. There is no need for somebody else to come and give us what we don't have because we have all that we need in Jesus Christ. And so he's pointing that and he's making it very clear that he has spoken to us in these last days by his son. Now, at this point, he gives to us a sevenfold description of Jesus Christ. A sevenfold description. We'll look at each one of those briefly. And notice with me what he says concerning him. In verse 2, he says, Has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. First, he's appointed heir of all things. He is appointed heir of all things. That word appointed means established or ordained. He has been ordained to be the heir as the son over all things that exist. In Psalm 2, verse 8, it's an interesting scripture. It says, ask of me and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. I will give you the heathen. And you know who the heathen were? Us. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he actually inherited us, especially as we gave our hearts to him. And as we gave our hearts to Jesus Christ, he now owns all things, including us. And the Bible makes it very clear that we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are his own special people that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So one, he's been appointed heir of all things. Two, through whom also he made the worlds. When it says he made the worlds, the word worlds means the eons, the created universe of space and time. All things that you see that exist, exist through him. Jesus Christ created all things. In John 1 verse 3, it says, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In Colossians 1.16, it says, By him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. So Jesus Christ is, is the one who is the creator of all things. Now the third thing, he is the brightness of his glory. When it says who is in the brightness of his glory, that word brightness literally is radiance. It speaks of sending forth light. The point he's making is Jesus is the visible manifestation of God. Even as the sun's radiance reaches the earth, God's glory has shown on the hearts of man through Jesus Christ is the point that he's making. In him was life, that life was the light of men, and that light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He is the brightness of his glory. A fourth thing we see in verse 3 is that he's the express image of his person. When it says the express image of his person, it is his nature, the nature of a person or thing. The word there uh, speaks of character, the character or exact rep expression of any person or thing. It's a precise reproduction in every aspect. In other words, all that God is in human flesh, Jesus is. Jesus is God in human flesh. It's an interesting story. It's found in the Gospel of John chapter 14. I'd like you to turn there with me for a moment. I want to show it to you. Interesting, John chapter 14. One of the more powerful portions of Scripture. Beginning at verse 1. 
Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, in context, this is the last night that Jesus is with his men. Jesus has been giving them final instructions. He is there at the table with them, and they've been celebrating Passover. Even as they have been celebrating Passover, the Lord Jesus Christ has been instructing them concerning who he is and what they're to do. Uh, the Bible tells us in chapter 13 that, that Jesus knew that it was time for him to, uh, to leave, to depart, and therefore he gave him final instructions. And, and one of the things that Jesus intended to do is to instruct them concerning how they were to live and what they were like, uh, what they were to be like and all. And so that's when Jesus got up and began to wash the disciples' feet with uh, that basin of water and and that's when he dried their feet off. And you know the whole story. We've gone through it many times uh, that the apostle Peter got upset at him for doing so and told him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus had said to him, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part of me. And, and he said, then give me a complete bath because I don't want to be separated from you. And after Jesus had finished doing that, he, he sat down and he began to instruct them. And as he was instructing them, he spoke to them concerning many things. One of the things he began to speak to them about was the fact that he was going to depart, that he was about to leave. And they didn't want to hear that. They didn't like the idea. As a matter of fact, when he was beginning to speak concerning betrayal and all and how that one of them would betray him, the apostles got extremely upset over that, and especially the apostle Peter. Though I'll deny you, I will never deny you. I would even die for you, the apostle Peter had said, and so said the rest of the apostles. They couldn't fathom the idea that one amongst them, one of the 12, would actually be able to be a betrayer, somebody who would actually take Jesus and sell him out. Couldn't believe that whatsoever. But of course, we know the story, and we know that there was one amongst them, that man named Judas. Well, Judas has departed, and as Ju Judas has departed, the people are still, the men are still upset. They're still upset because Jesus Christ is speaking concerning departing and all, and that's why he says in verse 1, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And I want you to know that in my Father's house are many mansions, and I'm preparing a place for you. If it weren't so, I would have told you. But he says, I want you to know that I'm doing this. And then he says in verse 4, where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, how, do you, how are you supposed to know that? Well, all the way up in the Gospel of John, all 13 chapters, when you look at the life of Christ and the teachings of the Lord, he's been making it clear to them the whole time where he's going. He's let them know so many times. And yet, it would seem to me that spiritual lessons aren't learned the first time you hear them. And I've discovered that to be true generally in, in just learning, in just learning things. I don't learn things the first time I hear them. Perhaps you do, and you may have one of those great memories and all that. Once you hear something, you just got it down the very first time. I'm not like that at all, never have been. It took a year before I knew that. When my mom said, David, it took a year for me to understand she was talking to me. I didn't even know that was my name, of course, for the first year. year. I had other names later on that I recognized, and David was one of them. But the bottom line is, is we don't learn the first time, do we? I mean, the first time the Lord speaks to you and says, this is what I want you to do, you might think, oh, what is that going on? What is that that I hear? It's kind of like when Samuel was there as a young boy after Hannah, his mother had, had uh, dedicated him to the Lord, and he was there in the service of Eli the priest, and and there he is as a little boy laying in bed, and he hears the voice of the Lord say, Samuel. And he gets up and walks into Eli's room, and he says, you called me? And he says, no, I didn't call you. Go back to your bed. And so goes back to bed, and once again, he hears the voice of the Lord, Samuel. And he gets up and walks once again and says to Eli, did you call me? Here I am. He says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Finally, when he does it again, he realizes, he comes in and says, did you call me? And that's when Eli, the priest, says, look, the Lord is speaking to you, so when God speaks, next time, say, I'm listening. The very first time he heard, he thought it was Eli. The second time he heard, he thought it was Eli. Ultimately, he discovers it's not the voice of Eli. It's the voice of the Lord speaking to him. And that's kind of how it works. That's why Jesus said to them, what I'm doing to you now, you do not understand, but you will later on. The things that I'm declaring to you right now are not things that you understand initially or immediately. But if you act on the first few things that I give to you, I'll give you experience. You'll begin to understand my ways and know my voice so that I can speak to you more clearly in the future. And that's what Jesus is saying. So he's saying, listen, you're troubled. You're troubled because I have told you these things. 
You're troubled because I've told you all of you will forsake me and flee this night. I, you're troubled because I, I told you that I'm being betrayed into the hands of wicked men. I've been preparing you for this all through my ministry. I've told you several times that that was going to take place. I've told you I'd be betrayed. I told you I would die. I told you I'd be buried. But I also have told you on the third day I'd be raised again from the dead. But you're not listening to me. Let not your heart be troubled. Have courage. And where I'm going, you know. And the way you know. Well, Thomas, verse 5, said to him, Lord, I like this man, Thomas. I really do. Because you know the other guys were thinking this. He spoke up. Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Well, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him. And notice, and have seen him. No, well, Philip said to him, Lord, well, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And then Jesus says this incredible word, verse 9, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? I've been with you, ministering to you, revealing myself as who I am to you for all of this time. I've been with you so long, and yet... You haven't known me. How do I illustrate that? I wonder if when Pastor Chuck Smith, who is my pastor, and I love him very much, respect him extremely, I wonder if when his kids were growing up, I wonder if they knew that he's Pastor Chuck Smith. Nope, they saw him as dad. I wonder if Franklin Graham and the rest of the Graham family knew that Billy Graham is Billy Graham. Probably not. They knew him as dad. But somewhere along the line, they came to realize this man is my father, but this is a man who is used mightily by God too. You see, in my marriage with my own wife, Marie, um, I am her husband, and I am her friend. I am... Uh, with her, the father of our children, and I have a variety of hats that I wear, but I am also her pastor. I am not just her husband. I am not just her friend. I am not just the father of our children. I am her pastor. She knows me, in other words, as not simply being uh, David, the guy that I'm married to. She knows me as the guy that God uses in her life to help her to understand the ways of the Lord. And there is a moment that comes when you realize that this person is more than simply what I see them to be. And here, the Lord Jesus is asking that question in a cosmic sense when he says, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? Have you gone to church for so many years and still haven't seen him for who he is. There are so many people who go to church, hear Bible stories, who never really put into practice the things that are being taught, and as a result, the Lord is not manifesting himself completely to them because they don't see him. Notice in the same chapter here, John 14, notice with me at verse 21. Look in John 14, 21, where Jesus says, uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and notice, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, says to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. How will I manifest myself to you? You will recognize me for who I truly am, and in doing so, you will obey me. And as you obey me, you will see me for who I am. You will recognize me for being God in the flesh. Have I been with you so long, and you have yet to know me? Going back to Hebrews chapter 1, Continuing, 
The fifth thing he speaks about is upholding all things by the word of his power. Well, he made all things, and he also keeps them together. He maintains and supports everything. He is the preeminent power. He's the sustainer of the universe. Uh, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, Colossians 1.17. What keeps the world together? And Jesus Christ. He's the one who keeps us together, too, by the way. I remember a little boy who was getting on his mama's nerves. He was about five years old, and he was very bored, and she had nothing to do that would keep him occupied. And so she had a magazine, and as she was going through the magazine, she, uh, she found a picture of, the, of a globe. And, and so she took it, and she pulled that, that picture out of the magazine, and she cut it up like that into small pieces and made a little jigsaw puzzle out of it. And it was very complicated. I mean, it was a picture of the world, and this little boy was, was just not old enough and sophisticated enough to really be able to, to put that puzzle together again. So Mama knew that it's going to take some time for this little guy to get this done, and she could finish a lot of housework and the things she needed to do before he'd be through. So she put all the pieces on a table. She sat him there, and she said, Son, put the world back together again. And she walks out to do something, but about 10 minutes later, he comes walking in the room, and he says, It's done. She says, This is impossible. You couldn't have done that. He said, no, it's done, Mama. She walks in, and she sees the world, and the globe is once again pieced together perfectly. And she says, how in the world did you put that together like that? And he said, it was easy, Mama. He said, on the other side of, that, uh, of the world was a picture of a man. And, and when I put the man together again, the world was put back together again. Well, isn't that how it works? When you put the man together again and hold him together, the world can be brought back together again. And that's how it works. And Jesus is the one who puts all things together. He's the one who causes all things to consist and to subsist. He upholds all things by the word of his power. The sixth thing it says here is, by himself he purged our sins. By himself he purged. That word purged means to cleanse. In other words, by himself, we do not need any other savior. No other person can do what has already been done, and Jesus did this without help. Jesus did this by himself. Jesus did this alone. And the way that he did it is when he died on that cross for us alone. Even as he had stated to his beloved disciples, all of you will forsake me and flee. He died on that cross for us, and he did it by himself. And therefore, we need no other Savior because he paid the price for us. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. He purged us. And finally, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It's interesting that phrase or those two words, right hand, the right hand of majesty, right hand of God, is used some 100 times in Scripture. It speaks of the place of authority and power. And Jesus Christ is seated there at the place of power and authority. In Mark 16, 19, it says, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. In Romans 8, 34, the question is asked, who is he who condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So he has been seated. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His work is now complete. And all we do now is enter into the rest that he has. He has finished the work, and he has been seated. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says, But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. One time for all time. Is there anything else that needs to be done? The answer, biblically, is no. Is there anything else, any new revelation, any new prophet, is there any new sacrifice? Is there anything else that we need to have in order for us to be totally satisfied in relationship with God? And the answer is nothing. Is everything made possible for us? Do we have um, everything provided for us that is necessary for life and godliness that pertains to it? And Peter would say, do you already have all of that? Because in him you have fullness. You see, as a Christian, I came to the belief and the understanding that that, that Jesus Christ, when he satisfied fully his Father's righteous requirements, when he took upon himself my sin and voluntarily bore that sin, dying on that cross, 
When I understood that and I realized I could not add to it, there's not a single thing that I can do to, to increase its uh, effectiveness. And that what he was calling me to simply do is in, in, in faith, by grace, just receive. When I finally was able to do that, I entered into the salvation rest that was provided for me by Jesus Christ. I didn't have to do anything to earn it. It was given to me freely. It's something that I obtained because it was through, through faith in him. It was given to me, and I received it. And sometimes people see the blessings in your life and they'll say, how did you get all those things? You must be very disciplined at all. And there is a certain discipline to Christian life, of course. But they've been flooded. These blessings have been flooded upon us. They've been given to us by our Father who's provided it for us. I remember hearing the story of a man who was a very wealthy man and somebody asked him a question, how did you gain all your wealth? He says, you want to know how I would become a millionaire? He says, yes, how did you become a millionaire? How did you gain all of this wealth? He says, well, it's very simple. He said, when I was about six years old, he said, I decided to start a business for myself, so I went outside, and I, and I started selling lemonade, he said, and so I went and I picked some lemons from a tree in my backyard, cut them up, made some lemonade. I sat there, and I was selling the, the lemonade for a, a nickel a glass, he said, and after I, I sold all the lemonade, I put that money away, then the next year, next season, he said, I invest that into some other things. He said, I continue to do so. I started selling lemonade for 10 cents a glass, and, and the money that I made, I put it away, and I started to save it, and he said... Uh, and I started to do that for a number of years. And the guy said, and so that's how you became a millionaire? And he says, oh, no, no, I became a millionaire because my dad died and left me millions of dollars, you know. <laughs> that's how I became a millionaire. You know, sometimes we try to take the, uh, the credit, when in reality, the credit is given to the Lord. Everything that we have has been provided for us by Jesus himself. It wasn't by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's according to his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's God working in us. It's God providing for us. And this all comes because of Jesus Christ. And even as the writer is going to be telling us as we go through Hebrews, it's because Jesus is better. Because he is all that we need.